most of the photos you'll see today are similar to this. It's just going to be the landscape. Um, there are a few photos that you'll see individuals in it, and I've put those in there to give you a, a sense of perspective and, and scope and size of this battlefield. Um, we're standing on Last Stand Hill, which we'll visit in more detail in a little bit. Just a little bit about my background. Um, I've been involved with the Park Service at the battlefield since 1981 after my first visit. And um, in 1996, um, I co-founded Friends of Little Bighorn Battlefield with the late Rick Meyer and Joe, Joseph Marshall, who's on the right. I'm on the left. Uh, Joe is a, a descendant of two Lakota warriors who fought in this battle. He's a Vietnam vet and You'll find a lot of his books. Um, he has written one book on the battle, which I included in the suggested reading list that I sent out uh, earlier this week. I served as president for 16 years. Um, and probably my proudest accomplishment is working, uh, spent 12 years working with the superintendents of the battlefield and to overcome political and financial obstacles to ensure the Indian Memorial would be dedicated on June 25, 2003. Here I'm sitting beside the sculpture um, Spirit Warriors, which uh, looms over the inside of the Indian Memorial. I worked there in 85 and I work off season as a volunteer with my wife, Joanne Blair, who enjoys walking over this battlefield uh, with me as much as I do and walking over the battlefield. Um, I sp spend my time working in the visitor center, interpreting the battle with the customers, and Joanne contributes her experience and background in curation um, with the curation department. And this is the battlefield. Um, it's known by a lot of different names, Custer's Last Stand, uh, the Custer Battlefield. It was originally named the Custer Battlefield National Monument when the Park Service took over in 1940 from the War Department and who had been maintaining it since after the battle. Um, today it's Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument. The name was changed in 1991 through legislation and it was in that same legislation that would form the uh, Indian Memorial. This is an unusual view. Uh, we're standing just outside the boundaries of the Park Service. You can see the fence there. Um, this is from the north side. Most of the uh, photos you see of Last Stand Hill um, or the battlefield are going to be from the perspective looking up towards uh, where Custer fell. I, I've walked all over this battlefield for the last 40 years. And um, with my photography, my, I always, my mission is always to try to capture the mood of this place, what it feels like to visit there. You know, for example, you'll see a lot of the soldier markers, there, the soldier memorial markers that are dotted across the battlefield that were placed there in 1890, and they denote where a U.S. cavalryman of the 7th Cavalry um, fell, and they're fairly accurate, we've learned through archaeological work in the 80s. Um, but when you look upon that landscape, you can envision what it must have been like for these soldiers in their last desperate fight against the Lakota and the Cheyenne nations. Um, it's very spiritual. Uh, people, some people get uncomfortable when they go there. Uh, some people have planned a visit for 10 minutes and they end up coming back multiple times. That's what I'm trying to capture with my photography. So I hope I can share that feeling with you today. Now this shot, we were in the same place, but I've zoomed in and now you can see the target. Um, on the right side is the seventh cavalry monument that was placed there in 1881 underneath uh, is the mass grave where uh, as many of the 
human remains that could be found scattered over this battlefield were buried. But trust me, when you walk on this battlefield, there are still human remains scattered throughout this area. And then to the left, follow the horizon, you can see the Indian Memorial and the Spirit Warriors. This battlefield has been photographed uh, probably almost as much as Gettysburg. And even almost from the beginning, this is a photo that laid mysteriously unknown until 1990. A friend of mine, Jim Brust, loaned me the, uh, gave me the option to use this photo. <clears throat> it was taken in July of 1877, a little over a year uh, after this fight. Uh, John Fouch uh, came out of Fort Keogh. He came here unaccompanied by soldiers. When we were talking earlier about that wagon road, he is, John is up on Last Stand Hill, looking west towards the river. In the foreground, you'll see a lot of bones and two horses skulls. These are remains of horses that were shot and the last ditch effort by Custer and 10 of his men to try to make some kind of makeshift barricade. Um, and then also you'll see through here, wooden stakes that were placed there on June 28, 1876 um, after the battle. This is where the graves of soldiers were found. Um, some historians believe this is where Custer was buried, uh, but we'll never know. Uh, and then you have the river out here, the trees, you can see some of the river. Now, when I visited there in 81, my first time, I took along a old 35 millimeter film camera. I don't know where that camera is today, but I was shooting black and white uh, film and I captured this one of my earliest photos and I'm standing almost in the same spot John was standing and you can see the wooden stakes are replaced with the marble the marble markers the river again over here and you can see some of the markers down on deep ravine trail which will go down here in a little bit and here's the custer marker and it's changed and it's looked over look over the years um, this is uh, how it looked. Um, let's see, I think this was in the late 19th century. Uh, yeah, because the stone, the marble markers are pretty new. You can see that same bend in the river at the top left. And then at the top right, you start seeing the National Cemetery. Uh, that cemetery was dedicated in 1879. And today there's about 5,000 uh, veterans and their family Mary, uh, uh, members buried there um, all the way back to the Indian Wars of 1866. Soldiers are buried there that died 10 years before the Custer fight. They were, out of, they were brought back out of the old forts uh, along the um, Powder River country. And it goes all the way through Vietnam War. And then this is a fairly recent photo I took of the Custer marker which is now easily distinguished from all the others. Um, and where he really stands out besides having the different face is that most of these markers, as you see right here, just say US soldier, 7th US Cavalry fell here June 25, 1876. Now, just a quick background so you understand uh, what why we're here, um, you're looking at a, a map depicting the uh, Sioux War of 1876, or some people call it the 1876 Centennial Campaign. And we're looking in the area of the Powder River country. Um, what was happening is that 145 years ago, this day, the seventh, 12 companies of the seventh Cav were marching west from Fort Abraham Lincoln near Bismarck, North Dakota. And their mission was try to find the roaming bands of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse who were somewhere 
out in here. They weren't sure exactly, but the reason why they wanted to capture them is that they had Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse had refused to sign any treaties with the US government, they, specifically the Treaty of 1868, which granted uh, the Great Sioux Reservation, uh, basically everything in South Dakota, west of the uh, Missouri River, including the Black Hills. Um, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse refused to live on the reservation. And then to make it even more complex, gold was discovered in 1874 in the Black Hills. So the government basically needs, they're gonna return, try to return the Indians back into those areas. Uh, this was a major campaign that involved three different uh, command structures working independently, independently of each other because it was too large an area to work together. So you had soldiers coming out of Fort Ellis near present day Bozeman, Montana. And then lastly, South General Crook coming out of Fort Fetterman in, uh, near Douglas, Wyoming. And they would eventually get into the area. Um, Custer was ordered to take the 12 companies, march up the Rosebud, look for evidence of Indians, which he finally found in mass numbers. And his scouts would find the village on the Little Bighorn early in the morning of June 25th. Um, probably one of the largest village gatherings of Plains Indians in history. Uh, there were roughly seven to 10,000 uh, uh, family members in there and anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 warriors. Um, so Custer divides his 12 companies into three different battalions um, and they end up becoming separated and that is um, seven of the companies under Major Reno and, and uh, Benteen would end up fighting their own fight for two days, four miles south of where Custer fit, would fall. And Custer would take five of those companies, continue to move north while Reno and Benteen are fighting their fight down south. And ultimately what I believe Custer his mission was very simple, very succinct. Uh, he was, his goal was to capture the non-combatants. If you capture the women and children, their mission was not to kill the women and children. Uh, their mission was to try to capture these Indians. And the only way you can stop a battle unless you're defeated is if you have the women and children, the warriors at that point would just stop fighting. He did this successfully at the Battle of the Washita in Oklahoma, eight years before this fight. So when Custer reached this area, which is today known as the Custer Battlefield, um, this is the National Cemetery. Uh, this is Last Stand Hill. What you're looking at is basically where the five companies would pretty much fall when it's all over. Um, they would be fighting along this half mile long Battle Ridge, which we call Battle Ridge today. Um, Custer positioned L Company under Calhoun on the south end. Today we call it Calhoun Hill. C Company was ended up down just the hill from Calhoun Hill into an area today we call Finley Finkel Ridge. I Company under uh, Captain Keogh, an Irishman who was anxious to fight his first Indian battle. Uh, his I Company would fall down below the ridge. We think he might have been held there in reserve. E Company, uh, the great, what's known as the Gray Horse Troop. That's the Indians. We always know where the where Company E was because Custer divided up his five companies into different color horses. E Company had the Gray Horses. So Indians always, when they saw them, they go. They always referred to the Gray Horse Company did this or did that. But anyway. E Company ends up down in the Deep Ravine area, and F Company, uh, the, the band box company, they were always spit and polished perfectly. They, most of them would fall under Custer on Last Stand Hill. Um, you see the CRT, that stands for Custer Ridge Extension. When Custer put these men in position, he was continuing north, trying to reach 
a ford down in this area because the non-combatants were fleeing north up through here i he got pretty close either a contingent uh left last stand hill uh to try to reach that ford and re uh, reconnaissance where these uh non-combatants were exactly but for whatever reason which i think was because the south end of the battlefield was starting to fall they had to come back to this area so we're going to visit all of these areas today plus a few other places like the indian memorial for example Five major sector, sectors, as I mentioned, are Calhoun Hill, Finley Finkel Ridge, the Keogh sector, Deep Ravine and its trail, which happens to be my favorite area of the battlefield, and Last Stand Hill, as well as some other sites. So we'll start at Calhoun Hill. Uh, again, the south end of that half mile long Brattle Ridge. This is a photo we believe was taken in 1894 uh, by um, Locke, H.R. Locke. Um, he's standing right about on Calhoun Hill, looking north. In the center is Last Stand Hill. And then over here, you'll see this little wooden hill. You'll see that a lot in the historical and my photos. It's known today as Wooden Lake Hill. It was a, a Indian position that would be used to fire back on Company F on Last Stand Hill. And then right here is the Stone House. Um, it was built in 18, excuse me, 1894 to house the superintendent that. Um, maintain the National Cemetery. And then before here, right here is a wagon road, which is now today the Battlefield Road, which you can drive on. It takes you from the Visitor Center out to Reno Benteen Battlefield. It's a five mile drive. Um, if you can ever visit the place and you have time, I highly recommend you visit Reno Benteen Battlefield as well. And then lastly, you see some markers down here. That's getting down into the keel sector. So when you when you visit there, there's a lot of wayside exhibits you can stop and read either from your car or get out. Um, we're now on the very south end of Battle Ridge, Calhoun Hill. Looking in this photo, we're sort of we're looking southeast, and we're looking to the right. Down in this area is this is the road, I like to call it a road because it pretty much is like that, that the Indians would use to enter this battle. Uh, they would be hitting Calhoun Hill and uh, L Company and Company C first because this was the closest link coming from the village, which is just beyond the river. This is the Little Bighorn River here. Uh, this is, we call this Deep Coulee today. And it was a perfect road to take them up to Calhoun Hill. And here's another longer shot uh, looking down towards the mouth of Deep Coulee. In the background on the horizon are the foothills of the Bighorn Mountains. It's a beautiful country. And these men came in on their horses and whenever they dismounted to get on skirmish line, they had to do something with their horses, right? So that every fourth man would take four horses and try to take them into a protected area. In this case of Calhoun Hill, we're on Calhoun Hill, by the way, looking north. This is just Wooden Leg Hill out of sight. But down here is what we call Horse Holders Ravine. It's quite a long, deep, I think, well, not as deep as the deep ravine we're gonna visit, but it's pretty good. You can see here, we're field trip we're crossing from the Keogh sector down across uh horse holders ravine and up here where people are gathering this is calhoun hill and the horses would have been kept in this area now we'll see some of the soldier markers on calhoun hill um this fight um and you can see out here the uh Visitor Center National Cemetery in Last Stand Hill. But I think of this fight as collapsing. It wasn't in sequential order the way we're going. 
Um, the South End of Battle Ridge, Calhoun Hill, Finley Finkel Ridge, they were doing most of the fighting early on. These soldiers had Springfield carbines that had a range, a, a deadly range of almost a thousand yards. And they were used at uh, in deadly effect. They were able to keep the warriors back for quite a while. I mean, the warriors fighting in this battle had fought the army before. They knew how to fight them. They knew what they had to do to defeat them. And they didn't ride in here on their horses like in the movies. That's one of the myths of the Little Bighorn. And they didn't start riding around these soldiers. What they were doing was dismounting their horses like the soldiers and moving in on foot uh, to hit these soldiers. Now, with Calhoun fighting, C Company was there early on, um, but they had to be eventually moved down to Finley Finkel Ridge. And the reason is that as more and more warriors came into this fight, they had pushed Reno off the valley and he fled up to the hill and started digging in where he would hold out for two days. So all these warriors were free to, to start moving north again they had to go through their village, they had to cross the river, come up their deep coulee, and as more and more of them entered the fight, a lot of them literally had to move around into a different area because the traffic was so heavy in a way. And they started coming across an area on the battlefield called Greasy Grass Ridge, um, which con is connected to Finley Finkel Ridge. So I believe Company C had to come off Calhoun Hill and move into this area to push the warriors back. And the reason, keep their weapons out of range. These warriors were, were well armed with lever action rifles like the Henry and the 1873 Winchester. A powerful weapon. The Springfield only shot one bullet at a time. And remember a range of almost a thousand yards. The Winchester could shoot 10 plus bullets, but they had to be within about 100 yards to have any deadly effect. So Company C has probably moved down here to push the warriors back. We're looking at a historical photo. Um, I believe this is a Walter Camp photo taken around 1908. And we're now we're looking in the same general area. This is from the area that Company C probably were taken off of Calhoun Hill and moved right down in here. Here you can see some markers. You can get a better shot seeing here the Bighorn foothills with some of the snow. Now I mentioned the warriors coming in on horseback and dismounting. We're, we're now on the military crest of Greasy Grass Ridge looking below the backside. Uh, the river there is in the background. These warriors came in and dismounted perfectly in this area. It's a perfect natural corral because there's steep bluffs you can see here that enabled the, the horses to be a perfect place. They could graze while this fight's going on. And the young boys that weren't old enough to fight yet uh, from the village, they would follow their warrior friends in and they would hold the horses much like every fourth soldier uh, in the army was holding theirs. This is where they gathered, dismounted and moved up through here to hit uh, Finley Finkel Ridge. This is another shot from the backside, shows you how rugged the terrain is there. And this is um, one of my personal photos of Finley Finkel Ridge. Uh, in the foreground are a couple Markers for lone soldiers were standing on about the center of Battle Ridge. And the markers in the center in the background are those of Finley Finkel Ridge. Now, the reason why we call it Finley Finkel Ridge is that two of the sergeants from Company C were found there, Sergeant Finkel and Sergeant Finley. That's why we're confident this was Company C. And look in the background, you can see how rugged this land is. Um, we're looking on the horizon towards the Wolf Mountains. That's the area the 7th Cav would come across uh, to enter this village to fight. 
Now it was right around here uh, in 1985 when I was working there that I had my first experience with the spirits of the battlefield. Um, it, there was no, this is before VCR, there, there, there was no TV. So every evening, a lot of us that worked there, the battlefield was closed, we live on site. We would go out somewhere just to enjoy the evening Sometimes we would hang out at Last Stand Hill or go out to Reno Benteen. Um, the night, first night, I went out to Calhoun Hill. It was four of us. And I love it out there at night. You can hear the train going up the Burlington um, Railroad going along the valley floor. Um, every once in a while you hear a car, but uh, Tim Bernardis, who now is the head librarian at Little Bighorn College just down the hill from here, he was talking about how the Crow natives are, they won't come up here at night. They still don't. They believe spirits wander over this battlefield. And it's not hard to, to uh, think of that because you have all, you know, 5,000 people buried in the cemetery and you had 268 soldiers that fell in this battle. Uh, warriors lost anywhere from 50 to 100. Well, Tim was telling us that the crow talk uh, called the superintendent the ghost herder. And the reason for that is that every night when the superintendent would lower the flag, the crow saw that as a sign that the spirits were being released from their graves to go roam over this battlefield. And then in the morning when he lowered the flag, that was his signal to, for the ghost to come back into their graves. Well, it was a beautiful, quiet evening. And right when Tim said that, the wind kicked up, rattled the Coke cans in the back of Ellison's truck, and we got off of there and went back down to the apartments. Uh, so it's just one of many experiences. Maybe I can do a program in the future on ghost stories, but for now, we'll move on. <laughs> Another shot of the uh, Finley Finkel Ridge. One thing shooting this battlefield for 40 years, I, I've learned what time of year the, where the light is gonna come from. This is sunset. Uh, it's only this time of year, May and June at sunset that the Finley Finkel Company C markers shine because the light is, sun is setting to, over our right shoulder coming across the big horns. And any other time of the year, you could be standing in, in this same spot and not see these markers. Now this is the far end of Finley Finkel Ridge and we're looking at a very important area. We're looking at this rugged area, which is the area of the deep ravine, which we'll go into momentarily. But this is the, the avenue, I believe, the road that I believe Crazy Horse finally would enter this battle. Uh, it took him quite a while to get down here from Reno, ben, the Reno fight. Plus he was concerned about the non-combatants flowing here from left to right. And he finally realized these soldiers are getting too close. And he, he was followed by about a hundred warriors. They, they followed him by choice. That's how the Indians fought. He never could direct someone to fight with him. Um, and then over here, you can see some of the markers on Deep Ravine Trail. But Crazy Horse would hit here um, in conjunction with um, the uh, Calhoun Hill. And he would eventually, Crazy Horse would eventually go over the ridge here, Battle Ridge, to also hit Keo. This is Weir Point. We're looking southeast. This is where we think Custer saw the village for the first time in all its magnitude. And this is the deep coulee area down here. Couple of sun uh, sunset shots for, of uh, from the Finley Finkel Ridge area. I love to go there in the fall. This was taken in October of one year, and you can see the cottonwood trees are starting to change colors. <clears throat> Many of my friends that work up there in the summer, especially Mike Donahue, he's worked up there for thirty summers, but he. His day job is an art teacher in, in Central Texas. 
he's never seen this battlefield off uh, except for summer. And he's always blown away by my photos I take in the fall because the battlefield looks very different then. And now we come into the Keo sector. I uh, remember this is Company I that was probably held in reserve behind Calhoun Hill. Um, this photo is taken to, during one of the burial details the following summers after the battle. You see bones down here, horse bones. It was a constant struggle to try to keep this battlefield clean. Every, every time these guys came out in the summer, they were always finding human remains scattered all over this battlefield from predators and natural erosion. Uh, they've put up a marker for Captain Keogh and his company, I, and this is where his marker is today, almost the exact same spot. These guys were hit suddenly. Uh, Indian warriors had been congregating behind these ridges. <clears throat> and as Calhoun started to fall, um, these Keo was hit by the warriors coming over through Calhoun Hill. And then from this east side, um, they were over overwhelmed in just a matter of minutes. Um, I mentioned the Springfield carbine, it shoot, shoots one bullet at a time. Um, once that was done, the soldiers had another weapon to choose from. They carried a good old fashioned Colt 45 1873 revolver. Powerful weapon for close in fighting, but once you've shot all six bullets, at that point, soldiers were throwing their revolvers at the Indians. Um, it was hand to hand fighting. And as they struggled, uh, they would try to work up, come up to this area. Now, this photo is another fall shot. This is sunrise, um, and this is in September. You can see we're a point down here. Way down here is Calhoun Hill. This is the Keogh sector all through here, and you can't see any markers because, again, I wanted to get this shot. The light was just right where you don't see the markers. What you're looking at, except for the road right here, you're pretty much seeing the battlefield like it did uh, the way it looked in 1876. Excuse me a minute. Similar here, you can't see the markers, but you can really see this ravine where the warriors were able to sneak up and hit Keo. I'm standing just off on the east side of Battle Ridge from Last Stand Hill. The Indian Memorial is behind me. And now you can see some of the markers here. What these guys represent, I think, um, forgot about this one. We're doing a field trip down into Keogh. This is Jerry Jasmer, retire now, one of my favorite. He was one of my favorite rangers. He's standing at the keel marker. But here you can see a line of markers heading up to where this is last stand hill. These were probably guys trying to make, trying to get back to, or trying to get reach last stand hill. Uh, they, they could have seen it was the command post. At this fight, it is at this point, it's a running fight. Um, each man for himself, the warriors, they described the fight, this battle as uh, like a buffalo hunt. They were just chasing these guys, kill, firing on them as they ran. And this is another shot. Um, this is a photo I took in 2005. It's on the cover of Stricken Field. It's one of the books I recommended. Um, if you wanna learn about the history of the battlefield, his uh, Jerry Green's book is outstanding. This is Wooden Leg Hill and Last Stand Hills right up here. And now I'll show you some fall shots <clears throat> of the Keogh sector. This is Horseholders Ravine right here. I like this one. It, um, 
it's you look at this and you know we study this battle from a military historical perspective you know about what company was where what you know where did they go uh, we sometimes forget these were soldiers of the u.s government and the u.s army they had traveled almost six weeks to reach this point uh, and boredom uh, up to up to now it took them six weeks to travel to march what you and i can drive the same way in one day it's about 500 miles from here to fort lincoln near bismarck north dakota and these men were leaving behind families um one thing that really brought this out to me was during the 1985 archaeological dig on deep ravine trail they found a wedding band uh, through metal detectors and the wedding band was still wrapped around the finger bone of the soldier who wore that wedding band and it, when you see that it makes you wonder you know who was his wife did he have any kids uh, and they would have never known they would have only known that he died fighting with Custer they probably never they would have never come out here um, and this marker says U.S. soldier we don't know who this guy was I think he might have been trying to escape from Calhoun Hill or Keogh sector who knows and now we'll go down to the deep ravine and its trail um, again one of my favorite areas of the battlefield because it's such a mystery um 28 soldiers were found in the deep ravine which we're going to see here in a moment um, many of them were identified when they were all buried on june 28 1876 the survivors of the other seven companies would have that terrible job to do um this was photo i believe was 1908 um walter camp who was a great student of this battle um, came out here with uh, survivors of that those seven companies and they D Daniel Knipe he would identify a lot of the soldiers out here on June 28th and he was showing camp where he remembers their bodies were found and this is the head of the trail um, another mystery here uh, it's beautiful rugged country This is another favorite of mine. I took this one October. Um, it was a mother and her son, and they had come to the visitor center, and they yeah, I just muted it there. That's fine. And they um, they had shown they showed me an ad. She she was a model, and they had taken a picture of her wearing this beautiful evening gown down the trail here, beside some markers, soldier markers. And they asked me, do you know where that is? I said, yeah, I know exactly where that is. But I was the only one on duty. Everyone was out to lunch. So I brought them here and I told them, you don't have to go very far. And then I had to go back to the visitor center. And I said, I'll come back and ch check on you. I came back about 20 minutes later and they were gone. And I turned around when I left them and took this shot. And this is for me a mystery and a mystery. I, I don't know. I never found out who this mother and son were. And looking back from the head of the trail, you can see the visitor center and the National Cemetery. Now, I've been talking about soldier markers. Um, just 30, about 30 yards from the head of Deep Ravine Trail you come across a warrior marker. Um, there's a number of these scattered on the Custer battlefield and the Reno Benteen battlefield. Um, Neil Mangum, who was superintendent through from 1998 to 2001, he wanted to do everything he could to bring this story of the Indian side of the story to the surface. And be, under his administration, we would see warrior markers for the first time and we'd see the Indian memorial, memorial come uh, dedicated. This is a marker for a black white man who was Lakota, and he was cousin of Black Elk. I'm sure most of you all have heard of Black Elk. And 
Black Elk was only about 14 at this fight, so he didn't participate as a warrior. But when the battle was all over, he would enter the field with the women and children and they would scatter around. They were trying to find anything worth of value they could take. And Black Elk came across his uh, cousin, mortally wounded, uh, his cousin, Black White Man. And we continued down the trail. This is where the model was trying to find. She took her picture. They took her, a picture of her in the evening gown here. Um, the black white ma man marker is just out of sight off trail here. And we're looking back up to Last Stand Hill, of course. And from Last Stand Hill to the deep ravine, which is right below where this individual is at, it's about 670 yards roughly. Halfway down the ravine, uh, the trail to the ravine, you'll come across one of the few markers with a name. This is for Mitch Boyer, who was an interpreter scout for the Custer Battalion. Um, they found his remains here in, in, uh, during the dig of 85. And from there, after Mitch Boyer, you start to move downhill. It's pretty steep a, a descent at this point until you finally reach the trail's end. It's here if I take people down there that have never been there before, I, I like to ask them to turn around at this point. And when they do, this is what they see. You'll notice they're, we're basically buried. You can't see the cemetery. You can't see Last Stand Hill. Um, these soldiers probably fleeing the Indians, trying to get away, had no idea where they were and they, they could have been easily being confused. And, and roughly 28 men would end up coming into the ravine, um, the deep ravine. This is the wayside exhibit that the Friends of the Little Big Horn Battlefield donated, um, painting depicting some of the action that um, happened down there. We know these from Indian accounts um, that talk about the fierce hand-to-hand uh, -hand fighting that occurred here because Warriors were jumping in to count coup on these soldiers, and a lot of them re were being killed by friendly fire. As you can see here, all the warriors lined up just shooting down at these guys. And here's that view. Uh, this is the head of the ravine. Down here, it looks like it dead ends, but it turns left in a, almost a 90 degree bend, travels another few hundred yards till it finally uh, empties into the Little Bighorn River. And we're across from that trails in in the wayside exhibit. And here you get a, a better idea of how deep that ravine really is. Now at this point, I think it's a good, we can go back up to the visitor center Take a five minute break. If you need to hit the restrooms or up ahead on the left, there's a water fountain. And I'm gonna, speaking of that, I'm gonna get me some water and I'll be back in five, okay? Down, we're gonna get off the beaten trail around the deep ravine area. From uh, Last Ten Hill, where this photo is taken, we're gonna be moving along this area. We're gonna see the mouth of the deep ravine the area from where more than likely Crazy Horse entered this fight. And we're looking across the vast expanse here up towards Last Stand Hill, National Cemetery on the left. And here you can see the, the edge of the deep ravine on the right. And here's the mouth. Um, in 1876, Mike, uh, there was a ford there. Mike Donahue found some old maps drawn by Indians and soldiers. Um, today, it's a steep drop, um, but at that time, the Indians were able to use this as a natural crossing place. They would move up through here and continue on, and Crazy Horse probably turned in this area to head up to Calhoun Hill, which is back this direction. You can see how deep, again, the ravine is. A 
when you can get off the beaten trail, you'll come across a lot of these lone soldier markers. This one just on the edge of the ravine where we had crossed over. That's a beautiful place. Um, it wasn't so beautiful on June 25, 1876. By the way, um, at the time of this battle, it was extremely hot. We estimate it was probably about 98 degrees. Um, when I walk in this battlefield, on this battlefield, if it's 85 degrees, I'm miserable and I'm not wearing heavy uh, clothing or anything like that. And now we're going to walk up to Last Stand Hill. Um, roughly 350,000 people visit the battlefield every year. Um, most of them walk up from the visitor center. Only roughly 20% take the time to go out to Reno Benteen. But this is where they come in most cases and where people again experience so many different feelings. This is a photo um, taken in 1879. Um, at that time, the, the army came out there to try to clean up the field. They built a cordwood monument, what we call that today. And remember those horse bones we saw in the John Fouch photo? They started gathering those ho horse bones and put them in this uh, makeshift cordwood monument. Um, this stands where the Seventh Cavalry Monument stands today, which was placed there a few years later um, in 1889. Uh, here you can see the wooden, some of the wooden stakes. No, this is 1880. The monument was placed in 1881, the Seventh Cav Monument. And this is uh, the gentleman on the right is Curly. He was one of Custer's four Crow scouts. He was the youngest of the scouts. He was only about 16 at the time of the fight. There's a lot of controversy on his story. You know, he, some people don't believe his accounts. I do. Um, he did change his accounts a few times, but overall we do know that um, he was with the Custer Battalion, um, but he lived in the valley uh, for many years. He had a cabin just down the hill here adjacent to the Little Bighorn River. Now the monument etched in the monument are the names of all the men, uh, soldiers, civilians, officers, and scouts that uh, were under the Custer but uh, seven comp 12 companies, well, the five companies that died out here. Um, we know their names, but many of them, as you have seen, are unknowns where they fell on the battlefield. Now, this photo is taken in 1941. I love this photo. Um, you're looking at the last Dan Hill. Um, the visitor center would eventually be here and then you have the national cemetery you have a water tank that's not there anymore it was re eventually replaced with an underground tank here which is still there today and functional um the water is fed down into the visitor center and the seasonal housings by gravity it's pumped up from the river filtered and then goes downhill as it's needed. You can see the Seventh Cav Monument here and markers. I'm sure they got, <laughs> they, uh, a lot of archeological data has been, is uh, long missing because of this. Early on, there was an iron fence around the monument. And this here is the cement base. You'll, that's still there today. And now what I like to do, I don't take video. Um, the visitor center is immediately to our right and we'll just walk up the hill and look at some of the photos around Last Stand Hill.
There's the Custer marker here. This is the cement base, the iron fence was placed. This is the Indian Memorial back here. I looked out with this shot, but as soon as I got it, Joanne and I fled down the hill to the apartment. If you're ever on that battlefield and you see something like this coming from the Bighorns, go to the visitor center. Get the heck out of there. And now we'll visit um, some of the other sites. Custer Ridge Extension, I mentioned earlier. This is the area that some of the soldiers, we think, went down and crossed over to the left to go down to the river and try to capture the non-combatants. We're, I'm standing here right about where we believe Custer might had turned right to go down to the river. We're about 100 yards from Last Stand Hill, which is right here. This is probably the most furthest north Custer or part of his units uh, got as far before they had to turn around. And now I want to address the warrior markers, which is something I been wanting to see happen there for a long time. Um, I mentioned 50 to about 100 warriors fell. We'll never really know because their loved ones retrieve their bodies or like a um, black white man, if they were wounded, they took them off the battlefield. Uh, the Lakota buried their loved ones in scaffolds are on the in trees matter of fact when the soldiers were rescued on june 27th they talk about all the the dead warriors up in the trees along the river the cheyenne uh, would usually put their remains in caves or through around rocks um, some of the ranchers along the uh, foothills of the bighorns they know where some of these remains are still today, but thankfully they keep it quiet. What instead of a memorial marker, the family would stack a rock cairn. Um, we're looking at one of them here on the Custer battlefield. This, we're confident this was for the Southern Cheyenne leader, lame white man who was killed by friendly fire. We know this because John Stans and Timber, who was an oral historian for the Cheyenne, he knew these warriors that fought in this battle, and he walked on this battlefield with some of those warriors who fought there, and then he graciously also walked over this battlefield later with then Chief Historian Don Rickey and a wonderful young archaeologist named Margot Liberty who was a young woman at the time, she still lives in Sheridan, Wyoming. He showed Margo and Don where a lot of these warriors fell, including the lame white man. And so Don Rickey, you know, the Indians have always wanted to see some memorial there to the Indians. Um, so Don Rickey put up this sign, says lame white man, a Cheyenne leader fell here. And that's John Stans and Timber standing next to the, um, well, I might my marker, and I want to thank Margot Liberty for allowing me to use this photo. Um, the problem is this marker is about 30 yards off the road. And at that time, people usually didn't get out of their cars. And then this is the 1950s. So Don Rickey started worrying uh, th that no one saw the marker. So he moved 
lame white man's marker up on the ridge. This is right off the road. And at that time, it said lame white man, a Cheyenne leader fell near here. And that was the only marker for warriors. And I, I sometimes like, a, like to joke that I wonder how many visitors visited this battlefield until 1999, thinking only one warrior died fighting the Custer Battalion. <laughs> because in 1999, the, the first red granite marker for a warrior was unveiled Memorial Day 1999, and it was for a lame white man. And my friend Clifford Longsu, he translated the Cheyenne name into the Cheyenne language. Don't ask me to say that. I still can't learn it. And then only about 30 feet to the left of this photo, a second marker was unveiled that same day for Noisy Walking, who was a young man. He was probably only 17 when he died in this fight. And here the markers are from the road. This is Noisy Walking. This is Lame White Man. And this is the Deep Ravine Trail where we were a few moments ago. And then lastly, this gives you a perspective of the lame white man marker in relation to seven, the last Dan Hill and the cemetery. This is another marker for bear with horns. The, he's just up the ridge from lame white man and noisy walking, which are just down here. And again, my absolute favorite photo of all, all the photos I've taken of warrior markers for black, white man. By the way, this is last Dan Hill right here. And now we'll visit the Indian Memorial. This is a blurry photo. I didn't take this. This was sent to me of the Indian Memorial under construction. This is 2002. And so the uh, last Dan Hill's right back there. I took this photo almost from the same perspective with the Indian Memorial completed. It's a circle. Um, inside are the panels on the walls that um, each one represents one of the tribes that fought there, as well as the crow. And the tr individual tribes, they were allowed to, to, to develop their own wording, what they wanted the panels to say. This is incredibly unique to our country. This is still the only memorial of this kind for the American Indian um, in the United States. Gives you an idea of how big, why these granite panels are. And you walk up to the memorial from across the road from Last Stand Hill. There's two entrances, east and west, but um, according to Plains Indian tradition, you enter from the east and you exit from the west. We're on the east side here. You can see where the trail forks off. This is a sunset photo. You can see the spirit warriors here and the circle of the Indian Memorial there. By the way, these are two more warrior markers right here. You can see those warrior markers here again. We're looking east, northeast, basically. And on the anniversary, June 25 and 26, the tr different tribes come here to remember their fallen. Uh, and they place their tribal flags here. So we'll go inside there we're looking again over towards um, the National Cemetery. And this is what we call the Spirit Gate. Um, looking the Seventh Cav Monument was the, the memorial was built specifically to center the Seventh Cav Monument. And the Indian Memorial's theme has always been from the beginning peace through unity. And this gate is symbolic of having 
the soldier, the spirits of the soldiers and the warriors who died in this fight to come together here within this circle to forgive and unite and heal. This is my personal favorite. I took this on a cold morning in February, 2005. The memorial was only two years old. And you can see here, these are offerings <clears throat> that the tribes leave. They, they might be bundles of tobacco, a colorful ribbon uh, to remember they're fallen. The sculpture is symbolic of the warriors that fought in this battle to defend their way of life. It was the end of the Buffalo culture. It was a last great battle, victory for the Lakota and the Cheyenne. But as you probably know, um, in the long run, um, it ultimately would end for their culture. Um, a woman is handing a shield to um, the warrior. I've, a lot of my Indian friends, Plains Indian friends, tell me that this that it shouldn't have been done. They say that in those days, the women were not allowed to touch the uh, weapons of this warrior. But I, I like it. It's symbolic that these warriors were going to, to give up their lives, and, and if necessary, to protect the women and children in the village. So... I, I want to give time for questions, um, but if you ever have a chance to visit, I know I've talked to some of y'all before we started that luckily live in that area, but I mentioned Custer died conveniently at the intersection of Interstate 90 and Highway 212. Um, it's right on the way to Yellowstone or the Black Hills. Um, if you've never had a chance to get this to this part of the country, I highly recommend it. Uh, we're walking back up from the deep ravine. Um, I hope you can get there uh, someday. If you've been there, I hope you can return. So I don't know if we have any questions, Jimmy. Yeah, we have several questions, Bob. Okay. If you're ready, uh, I'll yeah. start here from... Uh... Uh, Heidi McDonald asked how many uh, uh, people were in under Custer's uh, command. All together with the tw um, 12 companies that entered the battle the morning of the 25th, a little less than 700 soldiers. Um, Custer, with his five companies that fell here, 210 men. Uh, all together, when the battle was over, some wounded were taken back to Fort uh, Lincoln. But when all was done, 268 soldiers of the 7th Cav would die during these two days of fighting. You know, I, I mentioned I couldn't, didn't have time to go to Reno Benteen, but those seven companies four miles south of here, they were in dire, dire circumstances. Uh, they didn't have water, they had wounded, they were trying to take care of and protect, and they were completely surrounded by warriors. Um, it's, you know, at that time, it was, this was during our centennial, 100-year uh, anniversary, and people were back in Philadelphia at the big centennial exposition, and then they got word by July 4th that, of this great massacre that had happened, and they were shocked. How can how can we still be 
uh, being killed by Indians out there. What's going on? I mean, the irony of this is on the day of this battle, Sunday afternoon, June 25, 1876, uh, Graham Bell uh, uh, premiered his phone, demonstrated his phone for the first time at that exposition in Philadelphia. They saw all this amazing technology, yet we were still dying out here fighting Indians. Does that answer your question, Heidi, I hope? All right, Jimmy. Okay, Rod Norris asks, uh, uh, were the non-combatants trying to escape on foot or on horseback? Good question. They were mostly on foot. Um, the village all together ran about a mile and a half along the valley floor. And when Reno hit the village first from the south end, they naturally fled north. A matter of fact, some of them actually tried to flee. They crossed the river down in that area of Deep Coulee and Medicine Tail Ford that I mentioned. But then suddenly there was Custer coming with five companies. So they hightailed it back across the river to the west. And at that point, they're all running north. North. Um, they had to uh, flee about two miles from the north end of the village to where they were congregating. Matter of fact, where they congregated is right across, when you, if you're coming on highway or Interstate 90 from Billings, when you take the exit to go to the Custer Battlefield, right to the right across the railroad tracks uh, was an area of the river that they were congregating in a, around some trees. And that was a perfect, that's where Custer or his contingent was trying to reach when they went beyond the Custer Ridge extension. Uh, so they were fleeing on foot, but this battle altogether from when they started, it was about two hours from when it began to where Custer was killed. So they had had time to get uh, down there uh, to the north. So it's, it's, it does take a while, especially on foot. And that's roughly 7,000 people. You think of the, you can imagine the chaos in this village, 7,000 people just screaming and fleeing north up the valley as the warriors, you know, a lot of the warriors, they were still asleep. They had been partying the night before. And so some of them had to go way up to the west on the bench lands overlooking the Little Bighorn to get their ponies. Um, Cra crazy horse people were getting impatient he ha he had to go through this whole uh ceremony um that where he had to prepare before he went into battle uh, some accounts say he was 30 minutes getting this ready so people were anxious that's before he went down to hit reno um so this was quite a while uh, in time for these non-combatants to flee to the north um I'm getting sidetracked. I forgot. I'm got digressing here. What was the question again, Jimmy? I don't know if I answered it. Well, were the non-combatants trying to escape on foot, oh, or yeah. or were they on horseback? Yeah, they were on foot. Um, it, again, if Custer could have captured the non-combatants, the battle would have essentially been over. Okay. Okay. Bob Kaiser asked, "Did the the Indians have a lot of rifles and ammo, or did they use mostly bows and arrows, spears, and very knives? Good, very good question. Um, I mentioned the archaeological digs. Um, back uh, when I first started working here in the mid-80s, um, we told the story that the Indians were lobbing arrows over from the air and down into the soldiers, which they did do. But we found out um, during the first arch major archaeological dig of 1985 that was overseen by my friend Doug Scott and Richard Fox, they suddenly found they found evidence of these Indians being well armed with the lever action rifles, the Henry and the Winchesters, but many of them were still shooting bow and arrow, or that even some used old smooth bores. Um, but that's why this terrain is so important. 
in studying this battle. Again, in this photo, you can see how the warriors would have dismounted and moved in through these cuts and ravines just to work their way up. And eventually, without exposing themselves and suddenly pop up and fire their rifles, now they're doing major damage. Um, so they, the, the archaeologists and their reports concluded, and it was a big thing in the news at the time, that Custer was outgunned. And people are saying, wait a minute, how could he be outgunned when the soldiers were shooting these Springfield carbines, a powerful weapon that had the range of almost a thousand yards? How could they be outgunned? Well, they were outgunned because of the terrain that enabled the warriors to move in closer with the rifles. Um, so we had digs in 85, uh, 84, I should say, then 85, uh, then again in 89. Uh, where we were searching for the remains of the 28 men in Deep Ravine. I, I worked on that project. Um, and then we did a road survey in 2004, and we were still finding evidence of the weapons that the Indians used. And that evidence is spent cartridges that were ejected when the, after the warrior shot the rifle and uh, ejected the uh, cartridge. So we found plenty of Henry's uh, and um, the 45s, the 44s, um, cartridge uh, cases. We found a lot of bullets from the soldiers, especially that had not been fired. And since it was a single shot carbine that the soldiers were firing, when they ejected that single bullet that had been fired, they had to put another one in the chamber, close the trap door and be ready to fire. Well, in the, in the heat of battle, those soldiers were you know, dropping the bullet. And in some cases, we found uh, piles of the Springfield uh, carbine uh, weapon. We think the soldiers in skirmish order, like at Calhoun Hill, would have put a bunch of bullets, ammo down on the ground, and they would pick up at it to load and fire later. So we found a lot of that. Um, we only, if I, I might have my number wrong here, but l less than a dozen metal arrowheads were found on the battle during the digs. We found one during the 2004 road survey. Um, so yeah, they were, they were well armed with more than bow and arrow. So after this was discovered from the digs and the archeologists put out their report in 85, we started changing the interpretation that we tell uh, the story of the, uh, to the visitor at the battlefield that it was more than just bow and arrow, that Custer was having, and that also helps explain why some of this idea of the strategy of Company C and Company E moving down to push warriors back, it makes more sense now that we know that the warriors were moving in with these extremely deadly weapons. Okay. So, uh, let me let me make a let me just make a quick note. Um, I mentioned that there's remains, human remains, all throughout this battlefield. Um, if you do visit this battlefield or any national park or monument or military battlefield like Gettysburg, um, if you find anything on the ground, some people today at Custer Battlefield still come across a human bone. Um, if you find a spent cartridge or a bullet, turn it in. It's a federal fence if you take it off the battlefield. Uh, but if you do find something like that, turn it in to a park ranger or make a note of where it's at if you don't want to touch it and try to bring one of the rangers down there. All right, Jimmy. Uh, Lorraine Britton asked, uh, was Mitch Boyer a native or a member of tribe? Yep, he was, he was half, um, half Sioux and some people think his father was Portuguese. He was fluent in the Lakota. That's why he was there. He was like a translator or I should say interpreter. Um, he would have been, rec he, chances are good he was recognized in this fight uh, because he would have known a lot of the Indians in the village. Um, the same thing with Isaiah Dorman, who was the only black uh, cavalryman that fought in the 12 companies. He, he fought with Reno down in the valley at the beginning of the battle. And when Reno had to retreat 
from the pressure of the Indians back up to the hilltop, Isaiah Dorman uh, lost his, his horse was shot out and he, uh, he was a friend of Sitting Bull or Sitting Bull knew him, I should say. Um, Isaiah Dorman, he also spoke Lakota and accounts from the soldiers who survived of those seven companies, they talk about, they look behind and the last they saw is uh, uh, Dorman, he was being surrounded by warriors down in the valley. Um, and they would, he was, he was killed, um, but he is um, the one black man that was in this unit. Okay, uh, Guy Brent asks, uh, several battles in the Civil War were, were watched and witnesses chronicled by non-combat observers. Were there observers to this battle who contributed to our present day understanding of the battle? Definitely, and that is the Indian survivors. Um, women, the women and children uh, that weren't, that, that, I don't know, brave enough is the right term. I don't wanna say it that way, but the women and children were, once they were safely out of range, they were observing this battle. Um, Kate Bighead, uh, she apparently followed some of the warriors into the fight. She wasn't fighting, but she followed with him. I think she held a warrior's horse, if I'm not mistaken. Some of the accounts we know from her, she would later in life uh, be interviewed by Dr. Thomas Marquise, who lived with the Cheyenne. Uh, Mar matter of fact, I mentioned Margot Liberty, the unanthropologist. She was a, a good, she knew Thomas Marquise. Um, Black Elk talks about finding his cousin, Black White Man. Um, the as far as the soldiers, the seventh cab that survived under Reno and Benteen, they didn't witness any of this fight, except I think they might have seen the last moments on Calhoun Hill. And if you don't mind, I'll tell you, just to take a minute, but um, was when Reno and Benteen were, they were starting to dig in fortifications at, uh, at the Reno Benteen battlefield. It got quiet because most of the warriors had fled up here to fight Custer and they could hear firing coming from the north. And they all assumed it was Custer giving the Indians a hell of a fight. And one of the uh, company's uh, commander, uh, Weir, who was a good friend of Custer, he was really worried about him and he was upset because Reno and them went and go look for Custer yet. That's another long story, but the point I want to make is that Weir and finally the Reno's battalion and the Benteens, they would start moving north and carrying their wounded to try to get reach Custer. And they got to that high point uh, known as Weir Point that I mentioned earlier, showed in the photos. Um, from there, they could, the Calhoun Hill was maybe only a couple of miles to the north. And they described, the soldiers there described the seeing they saw Indians shooting at objects on the ground. And they saw a lot of gun smoke and dust. I think they witnessed, it was about five or 5.30 PM. This battle was over right about that time. I think they were, I think what they were seeing was probably the mop up, you know, uh, the warriors moving around, killing the wounded, which they did, or they didn't, if women and children found wounded, they killed them. Um, I think that's what was observed by Weir, Benteen and Reno. And suddenly they saw Indians coming from this battlefield to attack them on Weir Point. And they ordered a retreat and they moved back to the Reno Benteen battlefield and, and Benteen up on Weir Point said he planted a guide on in hopes that Custer would know they're over here because they still weren't sure what was going on. And they wouldn't really know until uh, they started looking at the, the, the battlefield starting June 27th when Benteen came out with his company. He investigated, he came up with some of the first analysis of what might have happened here. And then they buried the dead as best they could on June 28th. When I talk about burying the dead on the 28th, it was just a makeshift, literally putting some sagebrush on a body or, or scooping up some dirt and put it on it, on the body, because they only had three spades in the entire 12 companies. But most important is there were a lot of severely wounded men down in the valley being taken care of and prepared to, to move back to Fort Lincoln. 
One of those soldiers had his leg amputated down in, in the valley floor. Um, so they didn't have time to really bury these guys. The best burials were given to the officers and ultimately George Custer and his brother, Tom Custer, were given the best grave about 18 inches. That, that The rest was just a makeshift um, goodbye and plant the stakes to say this soldier died here. Hey, uh, Rod Norris asked what was President Grant's reaction to the battle and also do we know if scalps of the soldiers were taken by the uh, Indians? Oh yeah, well Grant, uh, everybody was just, I mentioned shocked back East, but the military, especially Grant, uh, th this campaign, uh, the Sioux War of 1876 was ramped up big time. They brought just about every uh, unit out here in the West to find, Sitting Bull had fled North into Canada. Uh, Crazy Horse was still fighting. Crazy Horse went and surrender till May, 1877. Um, so the fight, the, the Sioux War of 1876 went through the rest of the summer into the winter, into January. Um, so they were determined to punish the Indians. At that point, it was get, get them, you know. Um, and um, that's why eventually Crazy Horse would be the last to surrender. Um, what was the other question? Uh, Did uh, the Indians take any scalps? Of the oh, soldier? yes. Yeah, there was, um, well, massive mutilation in, in, in the uh, battlefield because uh, for various reasons, um, a lot of it cultural, spiritual, uh, if you decapitate your enemy or cut off their arms and legs, it's impossible for them to chase you in the afterlife, uh, which they believe could happen. Some of the Indians were angry. Some of the Cheyenne that were there were also in sand at the sand creek massacre in colorado and they were angry and they just took out that anger on these dead soldiers um the doctor during the archaeological digs dr clyde snow who's gone now a great forensic pathologist he determined looking at the remains that were uncovered during the digs that roughly if I got my numbers right, roughly 80% of the 210 men that fell with Custer, um, their wounds, although mortal, the, the most of the, the remains he looked at, they would have could have laid on the field mortally wounded for an hour. Uh, so what happened when the women or the young boys came across and found a wounded show, a soldier, they probably didn't have a gun. They would bash their head in. So every skull or remains of the skull that was found during the digs were just pieces. And they were always, the archeologists always described it or the forensic pathologists as blunt force trauma. Um, when, uh, during the, the, the war that followed at the Battle of Slim Buttes in September uh, in North Dakota, uh, it was known as the American Horse Village. That's where they found the gauntlets and guide on from the Keel Battalion. The the these were gauntlets that Keel would have worn, uh, and they found scalps in in that TP. And I believe that TP stands today in the Smithsonian Institute. Um, so there was mass mutilation taking place. Um, it was a gruesome sight on the twenty eighth when they had to bury these guys. They'd been out in that. I mentioned how hot it was there. They'd been laying out in that hot sun for two days. Um, so the bodies remains, the men that buried those 28 guys in Deep Ravine had to stop. They were vomiting. It was just incredibly difficult um, situation for the soldiers to go through. And when they found Tom Custer, his head was as flat as a pancake. And they only knew, they only recognized him because they found his uh, tattoo that said TWC for, for uh, Tom, uh, Tom's Custer. Um, so, Yes, that was the condition. Uh, and that was, again, a cultural thing that the Plains Indians did. It was they did that even when they fought a native enemy, they would do similar things um, again to protect themselves in the afterlife. Uh, we're starting to we're running out of time here and we've got several more questions. Uh, Lorraine oh. Ridden asks about no memorial at Sand Creek, do you know? Of? Um, no, but 
um, the Park Service, you know, has Sand Creek and they've done a great job. They've allowed, or not allowed, the agreement is that that, bat, that massacre site is, maintain, is uh, I don't know, controlled or maintained is the right word, but it's the Cheyenne are controlling what they're doing out there. And there's no memorials. Um, I, when I was out there about six years ago, there was just a little modular home, which was their visitor center. And then you have to take a dirt road out to where the little market, there's some memorials out overlooking where the Sand Creek Village was. And those are placed there years ago before the Park Service got it. But when we were there, it had been raining. It was September and I, you couldn't take the road. It was all dirt. So I remember talking to the superintendent. Do you know if y'all are going to pave the road? Nope, the Cheyenne do not want it paved. They they don't want, they want to control the number of crowds going out to that area. I didn't realize it was after 3.30. Um, yeah, we have, uh, we should probably wind it up here. There's a few more, maybe we can get in here. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll keep going if you want. Yeah, how does today's U.S. Park Service deal with U.S. genocide of in, indigenous people? Well, that's a that's a tough question. Um, we hear that question a lot of genocide. It's mainly that come from European visitors there. Um, and it's a very difficult question to answer because the Park Service, they are they're they're trying to they're doing everything they can to show respect, like at Sand Creek. And um, but you know, it can be argued whether it was genocide or not. It depends on how you define genocide. But I know this, I have a lot of Indian friends that I've known over the years from the battlefield. And matter of fact, um, Clifford Longsu, the Cheyenne who translated the names for the Cheyenne markers, he told Neil Mangum when Neil first came up, started there as superintendent in 98, um, Clifford told him that because Clifford, we started the Clifford is now the vice president of Friends of Little Bighorn Battlefield, but he told Neil uh, that the Cheyenne who live their reservation is just 30 minutes to the east of here. Um, they don't visit the place because there's nothing there to honor their people. And that's when the whole idea in Neil's mind really clicked. We got to do something that's because of what Cliff. Clifford Longsu told Neil, that's why we have an Indian Memorial and we have the warrior markers. And now because of that, especially the Indian Memorial, the percentage of visitors of the Plains Indians has climbed dramatically. Uh, so when we interpret this fight, most importantly, we, we uh, tell both sides of the story. And there are, there are Indian interpreters that work up there too. So we're trying, you know, I think the Park Service, I shouldn't say we, but the Park Service because I'm not a ranger, um, the Park Service, I think, does an admirable job to tell the story as accurately as you as they can. And when you look at some of the statues being taken down across the country, think about this. This is so important. I mentioned the Indian Memorial. There's nothing else like it. This is an example. It's a symbol of how the Park Service believes in telling both sides of the story. And I believe instead of tearing statues, we should be building more to tell the whole story, wherever that might be in this country. And if anyone can learn anything about how to, to manage this, they, they need to look at Little Bighorn Battlefield and Sand Creek. Park Service, in my opinion, has done an incredible job of managing uh, this battlefield. Hey, we probably should wind it up here. Just uh, one quick one. Uh, the Native Americans, how did they acquire their weapons and or upgraded weapons? Uh, simple. They got it through trade, trading uh, on the reservations through uh, also off reservation. There were still a lot of uh, like in the mining camps, uh, but um, they basically acquired them on um, at their agencies. They, they got they were and they were allowed to have it because they used it to hunt um just like we do today so that's how they got them and one thing i i want to mention uh, uh, i forgot to do this at the outset is that i very much appreciate ollie the osher lifelong learning institute 
for having me here today to talk about a subject that I'm passionate about. Um, and Scott Aldridge, I'll especially like to thank him. He's the one that suggested I do this. And lastly, you, Jimmy, for your, your, all the Tech Holster volunteers. So um, just like me, when I volunteer at Little Bighorn, we don't get paid, but we do this because we believe in what the Park Service is doing, or in this case, what Ollie is doing to continue our learning experiences. I never get tired of learning, as, as all of y'all I'm sure are here today. But yes, I'd like to thank all of y'all for that and for all of y'all for attending today. It really means a lot to me. I had a, a lot of fun. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, Bob. I'm all sorry right. we didn't get to everyone's questions, but uh, maybe next time you might do it again and uh, you'll be able to cover those that didn't get uh, their questions answered. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks, everybody. Get... Thank you.